Yo, what's up everybody, Professor V here, and this is the lecture for Chapter 12, Personality Disorders and Impulse Control Disorders. Let's go. Before we start talking about personality disorders, let's briefly define personality. Psychologists and psychological researchers refer to personality as the characteristics and qualities that form a person's distinctive behavior. It is also the sum of all the physical, mental, emotional, and social characteristics of a person. Maladaptive or rigid behavior patterns or personality traits that are associated with states of personal distress or impair the person's ability to function in social or occupational roles are called personality disorders. People with personality disorders do not generally recognize the need to change themselves. Personality disorders may be organized into three clusters labeled A, B, and C, which we will all discuss shortly. The warning signs of personality disorders emerge or are usually seen during childhood and develop further as the person ages. Some of the common signs of a developing personality disorder in childhood are disturbed conduct, depression, anxiety, and immaturity. It is estimated that six to 10% of the general population has a personality disorder. Often, people with personality disorders don't realize they have a personality disorder. They often do not feel that they need to change and they fail to see how their behaviors are disrupting the lives of the people around them. They often blame others for their own problems before considering themselves as the source of the problem. They believe their traits are egocentric, meaning they believe their behaviors and feelings are natural parts of the self, perhaps that everyone feels as they do. Because they believe their behaviors and feelings to be natural, they are less likely to seek professional help themselves and are more likely to be brought to the attention of a mental health professional by others. On the contrary, to those with anxiety and mood disorders which are egodystonic, they do not see their behaviors as part of themselves and thus are more likely to seek help themselves. I wrote about myself on an online bulletin board, sharing my personal anguish with strangers, wanting others to know just how deeply I had suffered. I wrote there were times when I entered a dark place in which I would experience an urge to cut myself at different places on my body, mostly on my arms and legs. I later learned that my self-mutilation or cutting was a symptom of borderline personality disorder, or BPD. I could not run or hide from these urges to cut myself and felt powerless to control them. I recounted how I had battled depression since I was a young girl and had begun cutting myself at the age of eight. The cutting would bring a momentary sense of relief, blotting out the negative feelings. Strangely, it became a way in which I could comfort myself and block the deeper pain I felt inside. Now, as a young adult, I realize I must find other ways of relieving my emotional pain. But I recognize it will be a long process that will take a great deal of work and therapy. Like this person, people with borderline personality disorder are often severely depressed and turn to self-mutilation in a twisted attempt to escape from emotional pain. But their problems lie deeper than depression. They involve the kinds of rigid, inflexible, and maladaptive behavior patterns that clinicians classify as personality disorders. These behavior patterns involve maladaptive expressions of personality traits, which have far-reaching consequences for that person's psychological adjustment and relationship with others. You see, personality disorders differ from other psychological disorders in which we have discussed in previous chapters. They don't affect just one aspect of a person's life, such as higher than normal anxiety or depressed mood, but it affects their entire life. Their personality is so rigid and their inability to adapt to social demands, social constructs, and life changes make life difficult for a person with a personality disorder to fit in with those around them or others in their lives. It is very difficult for them to have normal relationships, both platonic 
and non-platonic relationships. As stated earlier, personality disorders can be grouped into three clusters, A, B, and C. Cluster A consists of people who are seen as odd or eccentric by others. This includes paranoid, schizoid, and schizotypal personality disorders. Cluster B consists of people who are seen as very dramatic, emotional, or erratic. This includes antisocial, borderline, histrionic, and narcissistic personality disorders. Lastly, Cluster C consists of people whose main emotion is anxiety or fearfulness. This includes avoidance, dependent, and obsessive compulsive personality disorders. People with paranoid personality disorder are unduly suspicious and mistrustful of others to the point that their relationships suffer, but they do not hold the more flagrant delusions typical of schizophrenia. The pervasive suspiciousness can be to the point where they interpret other people's behavior as deliberately threatening or demeaning. They may become suspicious of family members, coworkers, neighbors, friends, relatives, and strangers. They are very sensitive to criticism, whether the criticism is real or imagined, and take offense in the slightest comments about them. Although suspicious of coworkers, people with paranoid personality can generally maintain employment. People who hold grudges, have few friends, suspect their spouses of infidelity without evidence to back up their suspicions, and are more likely to confide in others have characteristics of paranoid personality disorder. People with paranoid personality disorder are unlikely to seek treatment for themselves and are more often men than women. For example, if Shelly's friend tells her she speaks softly, she may overthink this comment and interpret as a threat on her character. This may lead to not trusting this friend and become suspicious of her at the workplace. Shelly is angered by the comment and holds a grudge against her friend, one of only a few friends that she has. Shelly is also very jealous and possessive of her partner and often accuses him of infidelity. Shelly is most likely suffering from paranoid personality disorder. Other characteristics of someone with paranoid personality disorder are hypervigilant, cold, aloof, scheming, devious, humorless, and argumentative. It is important not to get this confused with cultural and socio-political factors. Members of immigrant or ethnic minority groups and other cultures may seem as they have paranoid personality disorder and some seem guarded. This is most likely due to the fact they are unfamiliar with the language used and the cultural norms, rules, and regulation of the majority culture. It is also important not to get this confused with paranoid delusions as seen in schizophrenia. They do not believe that the FBI is after them for no reason. Schizoid and schizotypal are the other two personality disorders for cluster A. First, let's talk about schizoid personality disorder. Schizoid personality disorder describes people who have little, if any, interest in social relationships, show a restricted range of emotional expression, and appear distant and aloof. Social isolation and a lack of social interest in others characterizes schizoid personality disorder. Their emotional expression usually appear to be shallow or blunted, but not to the degree as in schizophrenia. People with this disorder rarely experience strong emotions in any direction, anger, joy, or sadness, and rarely smile back when someone smiles at them, such as when passing them in a hallway. Men with schizoid personality disorder rarely date or marry, while women are more likely to accept romantic advances and marry, however seldom initiate the relationship or develop strong attachments to their partner. However, this distance, not just with their partners, but with all other social relationships may be superficial. They may have deep curiosities about people and want to have closer relationships and wishes for love. However, they cannot express it. For example, Rico can be described as a loner. He doesn't show interest in social relationships and appears distant to those around him. He rarely shows any form of emotional expression and seems indifferent to praise and criticism. 
He may put on a superficial display of social aloofness, however, harbors a deep want for love that he cannot express. He often shows deep feelings and affection for animals rather than people. These are all characteristics of someone who may have schizoid personality disorder. Schizotypal personalities appear odd or eccentric in their thoughts, mannerisms, and behavior, but not to the degree found in schizophrenia. They experience ideas of reference. This could mean experiencing a coincidence. However, someone with schizotypal personality disorder may interpret the coincidence as something more, as have a strong personal connection or strong personal significance. This could mean hearing a song on the radio and believe the song is about them personally. They lack self-direction and often do not know where they are headed in life in the sense of trouble and setting and maintaining goals. They may be very anxious in social situations and environments and thus have difficulty forming close relationships. Studies have shown that the social anxiety that someone with schizotypal personality disorder is correlated with paranoid thinking, such as fears that others may harm them rather than the thought of being rejected by others. They are also high risk to suffer from other psychological disorders such as mood disorders, anxiety, and an increased risk of suicidal behavior. People with schizotypal personality disorder may also engage in magical thinking. This is where they believe that one event happened as a result of another. However, no link between the two events can be found. An example of this would be because my ears are red in color, thus someone must be talking about me. Somewhat overly superstitious. It can also be described as having a sixth sense. Their speech may be vague, but not incoherent or filled with loose associations as seen in schizophrenia. They may display odd, eccentric, and unusual mannerisms and engage in unusual behaviors such as talking to themselves in the presence of others. Just as in schizoid personality disorder, those with schizotypal personality disorder are socially withdrawn and aloof with very few, if any, close friends. For example, if Shelly feels she is possessed with having a sixth sense as being able to read someone's mind, talks to herself frequently while others are around and engaging in a conversation with herself that is unrelated to the conversation around her, speaks to others in a vague but not incoherent manner, believes that those around her are talking about her even though the conversations around her are about the weather. Shelly may be described as having schizotypal personality disorder. Schizotypal personality disorder affects about 4.6% of the general population, slightly more common in males and higher rates among African Americans than Caucasians and Hispanics. Mental health professionals are careful not to label schizotypal behavior patterns that reflect culturally determined beliefs or religious rituals such as the belief in voodoo. Some of the traits of schizotypal personality are similar to that of schizophrenia, just not as severe as seen in schizophrenia. Recently, it has been found that schizophrenia and schizotypal personality disorder share a common genetic basis and brain abnormalities. However, there are very few cases of people diagnosed with schizotypal personality disorder to go on and develop full-on schizophrenia. Now let's discuss cluster B personality disorders. First is antisocial personality disorder. A lot of the time you may hear people use the word antisocial as a means to describe that they don't like to be around or talk to new people. This is not what it means to have antisocial personality disorder and is an improper use of the word antisocial. This is more along the lines of avoidant personality, which is in cluster C and will be discussed shortly. People with antisocial personality disorder are antisocial in the sense that they persistently engage in behavior that violates social norms and the rights of others and who tend to show no remorse for their misdeeds. In some cases, they may even break the law. People with antisocial personality disorder can also be described as guiltless, impulsive, 
and irresponsible. They often show superficial charm and lack truthfulness. They repeatedly lie and con others. They will even use aliases for personal gain and pleasure. Often, people with antisocial personality disorder engage in reckless behavior, causing them to risk their own safety or risk the safety of others without caring. Mental health professionals have used the words sociopath and psychopath to refer to people who have antisocial personality disorder. Psychopath refers to the idea that is pathological issue with their person's psychological functioning. In terms of a sociopath, this refers to the person's social deviance. Antisocial personality disorder is found more in males than females, occurring in about 1% of women and 6% of males. It is often seen more in lower socioeconomic groups. It is also diagnosed in those who are 18 years of age or older. However, the pattern of antisocial personality or antisocial behavior may begin in childhood around age eight. It is often diagnosed as conduct disorder. And if conduct disorder persists into adulthood, the diagnosis is converted into antisocial personality disorder. Over time, antisocial and criminal behavior decline and may disappear altogether by the age of 40. However, not so for the underlying personality traits such as guiltless, manipulativeness, and callousness towards others. Often, antisocial behavior and criminal behavior are linked to one another. While there is an association between the two, not everyone who has antisocial personality disorder will become a criminal, and not all criminals have antisocial personality disorder. Many with antisocial personality disorder are law-abiding citizens and can be quite successful. However, they may still have the personality traits as we already discussed. This goes to show there are two dimensions to antisocial personality disorder. The personality dimension who only possesses the core traits and the behavioral dimension who act out generally unstable and have frequent problems with the law. For example, to people who know her casually, Shelly is very charming, but underneath her superficial charm is a monster. She is impulsive, self-centered, insensitive to others, irresponsible, has little anxiety, and feels no guilt or remorse when she hurts someone. She blames others for her problems and rarely learns from her mistakes. She sees others as tools to be used to meet her own needs. While she can appear to be the nicest person in the world, if you get in her way, watch out. Shelly is most likely manifesting antisocial personality disorder. Next for cluster B is borderline personality disorder. Borderline personality disorder is defined in terms of instability and in self-image, relationships, and mood. People with borderline personality disorder often engage and impulsive acts that are frequently self-destructive. In addition to the characteristics listed here, they are also characterized by a unstable self-image, history of unstable relationships, and dramatic mood changes or difficulty regulating their emotions. People with borderline personality disorder may have fragile personal identities and may be uncertain of their values, goals, careers, and even their sexual orientation. This is what causes them to have their deep sense of emptiness. They often have a fear of abandonment and thus tend to be clingy and demanding in their personal relationships, but this in turn can push others away. They have rapid alterations between idealization and outrage towards others. In addition to these rapid alterations, they have the inability to reconcile positive and negative aspects of self and others results, resulting in sudden shifts between positive and negative feelings. This is called splitting. Borderline personality disorder affects about 1.6% of the population and is seen more in women than men. However, the cause of this is controversial. It is also more common in Latinos than Caucasians and African Americans. There have been some very notable figures to have said they have borderline personality disorder. One being former Denver Bronco, Miami Dolphin, Chicago Bears, New York Jet, and current New York Giants ride receiver, Brandon Marshall. Man, that's a lot of teams he's been on.
Here is a link above to a short video on Brandon Marshall speaking about the, his diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. It is also in the description below. People with borderline personality disorder may be prone to fighting and exhibit a rage at the slightest sign of rejection or for no reason at all. I don't want to pick on Brandon Marshall too much, but if you were to look at his history on and off the gridiron, you may see symptoms of borderline personality disorder. However, what is good about Brandon Marshall is that many of his instances of fighting or on-field antics came before the diagnosis when he did not know. He is now fully committed to learning more about his diagnosis and works to reduce the social stigma and help others to reach out for proper help. Next, an interview with someone with borderline personality disorder. My name is Elizabeth Kennedy and I'm living with borderline personality disorder. Okay, and can you tell me what that means in your life? Sure. In my life, that means um, that I do a lot of um, impulsive and compulsive shopping. Um, I have problems with anger management. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, it's meant um, suicide attempts. And in the past, it's also been troublesome for me to have relationships. Mm -hmm. And also um, feelings of extreme loneliness. Yeah, let's start with that important one, that suicidality. Um, were you hospitalized? Yes, in the I past? was. Okay, tell me a little bit about that. Um, I tried to overdose once, mm -hmm. and I was hospitalized for the evening. And when my parents found out, uh, they brought me, insisted that I come back home. I was living in Vermont, home is the Boston area. So um, they said, you know, we know the best doctors and yada yada. So uh, they took me back home and then I went into a two week uh, hospitalization, which was um, a diagnostic mm -hmm. period. Was it a shock to you? Um, it wasn't a shock that they found something wrong, but I'd never heard of borderline personality disorder. Okay. How did they explain to you what it meant? Um, they explained that there were six, pretty much, I think there were six criteria and you had to meet, six or nine or something, and you had to meet a majority mm -hmm. of the criteria, and that I did, and that it was a fair, relatively newly diagnosed, mm -hmm. um, disorder. And the suicide attempt, when you attempted to overdose and went into the hospital, why why did you take the overdose? What was going on for you in your life that caused you to be in such distress? <clears throat> relationship. Um, I had been in a six-year relationship at that point, mm -hmm. um, and I was living with my boyfriend, and he was about to go off to flight school in the Air Force, and was leaving me behind, and you know things were really up in the air. Um, we'd been real on again, off again about whether we were going to get engaged or not, and him leaving was kind of like, you know, this is either going to work or it's not. And right before he left, I was stressed to the max. And I had opened up an, um, an email in his account because I was going to look for his grandmother's email address and I found an email from another girl that was n not really that big of a, big of a deal. But mm -hmm. I was so overprotective and I was so trying to grab onto anything I could that I just said, you know, this is going to lead to you cheating on me and then you cheating on me is going to lead to us not getting engaged and we won't get married, then I won't have a husband, then I won't have a family, then I won't have a job. And, blah, blah, blah. and before, you know, after five seconds, I had come to the conclusion that I didn't want to live anymore. So I just went in the bathroom and wow. swallowed pills like drank them like out of the bottle. Sounds very impulsive. Yeah. <laughs> that, that was crazy. One last thing about borderline personality disorder is that they may engage in self-mutilation such as cutting as a means of temporarily blocking or escaping from deep emotional pain. Another reason may be as an expression of anger or a means of manipulating others. Cutting may also serve as a way to counteract self-reported feelings of numbness.
The last two personality disorders in cluster B are histrionic personality and narcissistic personality disorders. People with histrionic personality disorder tend to be highly dramatic and emotional in their behavior, whereas people with narcissistic personality disorder have inflated or grandiose senses of themselves and, like those with histrionic personalities, demand to be the center of attention. People with histrionic personality disorder tend to be very self-centered, but their emotions typically seem shallow, exaggerated, and even volatile. In the case of receiving bad or sad news, their emotions are often overdramatic and they become unusually upset and in good news show exaggerated happiness and delight. They often demand that others meet their needs for attention and then play the victim when others don't meet their expectations. They are intolerant of delays of gratification, meaning they want what they want when they want it. Yeah, I said that right. Often, they are drawn to fads and even may dress over the top, such as this and this. I'm not saying anything about Cam Newton though. Honestly, I like his style. It may be difficult for those with histrionic personality disorder to develop intimate relationships and having a long lasting partner because their relationships are often very shallow and they tend to be wrapped too much on themselves. They often use their physical appearance to draw attention to themselves and act to, to the far end of the spectrum of their genders. Males tend to act and dress very macho, while women tend to act and dress overly feminine. A histrionic personality may lead to wanting to pursue a career in modeling or acting as they would be the center of attention. People with histrionic personality disorder may have a very fragile sense of self-worth and fragile self-esteem. They often try to impress others to boost their self-worth and if they lose the attention they have gained or fall out of the limelight, depression may emerge. People with narcissistic personality disorder have an inflated sense of self and they have an extreme need for admiration. They take wanting to be the center seen in histrionic personality disorder to a whole new level. They absolutely expect and even demand that others notice them, their qualities, and even when their accomplishments are ordinary, they expect to be admired for it. They are very self-absorbed and lack empathy for others. However, they are more able to recognize their thoughts and actions and thus their relationships with others tend to be more stable than those with borderline personality disorder. People with narcissistic personalities are obsessed with fantasies of success, power, love, and recognition. Just like those of histrionic, they gravitate to careers where they would be the center of attention. However, feel jealousy and envy of those who achieve greater success. Despite their personalities, they tend to be quite successful in their careers, although they exaggerate their accomplishments. Lastly, we will discuss the last three remaining cluster C personality disorders, avoidant, dependent, and obsessive compulsive personality disorders. Avoidant personality disorder describes people who are so terrified of rejection and criticism that they are generally unwilling to enter relationships without unusually strong reassurances of acceptance. Because of this, they may have very few relationships outside their immediate family. For those with avoidant personality, they may be unwilling to have strong, close, or strong relationships with extended family members. They also avoid group activities, both in work and recreational, because of the fear of rejection. They prefer to be alone, dislike parties, unless they are absolutely assured of acceptance. In comparison with schizoid and schizotypal personality disorders, they have social withdrawal. However, they still have interest and warmth towards other people. It is their fear of rejection that prevents them from pursuing relationships and meet their needs for affection. In a social situation, such as a party, family get together, or in a room with a group of people, they tend to stay near walls and avoid conversing with others. They have a fear of embarrassment 
Because of these internal feelings, they exaggerate the effort involved in trying new things, even the simplest things. Social phobia often co-occurs with avoidant personality disorder, suggesting there may be a genetic link. Avoidant personality affects about 2.4% of the general population. As an example, let's say Rico wants to be involved with people. In fact, he truly loves people and has strong needs for affection and acceptance. But his fears of rejection and public embarrassment prevent him from reaching out to those around him. Instead, he sticks to his routine and refuses to take any risk or try anything new. Rico is most likely suffering from avoidant personality disorder. People with dependent personality disorder are overly dependent on others and have extreme difficulty acting independently or making even the smallest decisions on their own. They become severely attached in their relationships and extremely fearful of separation. They depend on others' advice and aid to make some of the smallest decisions such as what to wear for the day to the grandest decisions such as who should they marry. Even when marriage occurs, they depend on their spouse to make the decisions as to how they should live, how to raise their children, who they can become friends with, where they can work, how to spend their money, and what they can do for fun and to relax. They rely on others to run their lives. Dependent personality disorder is more often seen in women than men often applied to those that who have such a fear of abandonment that they tolerate husbands who openly cheat on them, abuse them, and use their family resources up. However, a diagnosis of dependent personality disorder is controversial as this would be victim blaming. There is a link to other psychological disorders such as mood disorders and social phobia and it's also associated with hypertension, cardiovascular disorder, and gastrointestinal disorders such as ulcers. And finally, the last of the cluster C personality disorders. Come to think of it, the last of the personality disorders defined by the DSM. Obsessive compulsive personality disorder. People with obsessive compulsive personality disorder have various traits such as orderliness, perfectionism, rigidity, and over attention to detail but are without the true obsessions and compulsions associated with obsessive compulsive anxiety disorder as discussed in chapter five. They are preoccupied with perfection and thus their work is usually completed after the deadline, if ever at all, because they focus on every single small detail that others find trivial. They often start and then redo their work several times over or ruminate about their work so much that they never actually get started. Because of this, they often fail to live up to their own expectations. Because of their rigidity, it affects their social relationships and insist on doing things the way they want to rather than trying to compromise or make a deal with others. They find it difficult to make decisions and often wait to make the decision later, sometimes too late. They tend to be stingy with their money and their belongings. They find it difficult to be relaxed and thus they tend to act formal in relationships and inflexible on issues of morality and ethics. Wow, that was a lot of explaining of all 10 of the personality disorders defined by the DSM-5. However, I hope this isn't the case, but many of you may have been watching and listening to this lecture and thought about almost every single one of these personality disorders, if not every single one of them to be your personality type. I know it's hard to ignore, even as I was writing the script for this lecture, even as I read the script from the teleprompter in front of me, I can't help but think, maybe I have obsessive compulsive disorder. Maybe I have schizotypal personality disorder. Maybe I have avoided personality disorder. I can think of times and personal quirks of mine that may make it seem that I fall into one of these personality types. The truth is, I am falling victim to the Barnum Foyer effect. The Barnum effect as described by Encyclopedia Britannica is the phenomenon that occurs when individuals believe that personality disorders apply specifically to them, more so 
than to other people. Despite the fact that the description is actually filled with information that applies to everyone. In psychology, this may be if you see a list of several psychological disorders and identify with many of them despite not suffering from any. Remember the quintessential aspect of a psychological disorder. It must affect your daily functioning in all situations. For example, if you like to have your bookshelf clean, tidy, and organize your books from tallest to shortest, but have a messy room or let the dishes pile up without an overwhelming feeling of anxiousness, you do not have obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Despite the boredom foyer effect not being mentioned in your textbook, I think it is important and imperative that you understand this concept. Just because you read a list of symptoms of a psychological disorder or personality traits does not mean you have it. The DSM is quite vague when listing their criteria. Do not let it fool you. But seriously, I think I have all of them. Various controversies and problems attend the classification of personality disorders, including lack of demonstrated reliability and validity. Too much overlap among the categories, which you may have noticed. Difficulty in distinguishing between variations in normal behavior and abnormal behavior. Underlying sexist biases in certain categories and confusion of labels with explanations. This adds to the Barnum Foyer effect. For sexist biases, there is a stereotypical feminine behaviors identified as pathological with greater frequency than stereotypical masculine behaviors. Another problem is the diagnostic criteria itself. If we were to take a look at the DSM diagnostic criteria for antisocial personality disorder as shown here, the criteria states only three of the traits need to be seen in a person to warrant a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder. But why three? What if a person shows signs of two, but very strongly, or shows signs of three, but very, very mild forms of the behavior described? Do these cases warrant a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder? As you can see, the criteria can be very difficult to draw a line as to when someone should be diagnosed with a personality disorder. The same can be said of all personality disorders and many of the disorders described in the DSM-5. Also, many of the behaviors described in the personality disorders and other disorders are found in the general population in some degree. As I stated before on the previous slide, I can think of times of when I may have fit the diagnostic criteria for some of the personality disorders. Looking at antisocial personality disorder, it consists of being deceitful or lying for personal gain, failure to plan ahead, and impulsive behavior. All three of these are also seen in the general population. However, an explanation for this is how often. Does it affect your daily functioning and your relationships? If not, then you do not have antisocial personality disorder. The DSM categorizes psychological disorders, and this is one of the reasons why these controversies happen. However, the dimensional model of personality disorders depicts personality disorders as maladaptive and extreme variations of personality traits commonly found within the general population. This goes back to what I just said. How often does the behavior occur and to what extreme does it occur? Does it affect your daily functioning in all dimensions, personal, work, school, etc.? If it doesn't, the dimensional model would not suggest a diagnosis. The categorical way of diagnosing personality disorders is currently under review and will be updated in the next version of the DSM. As stated towards the beginning of this slide, another problem is distinguishing normal and abnormal behaviors. Many other traits described in personality disorders are traits the general population experience in a lesser degree. Just because you are suspicious does not mean you have paranoid disorder or if you make a quick decision without thinking of the consequences or the effects does not mean you have antisocial personality disorder. If you want to avoid a large party, that does not mean you have avoided personality disorder. Just because you brag about yourself 
that does not mean you are narcissistic. In some cases, this behavior is warranted and considered normal. Just as in having a depressed move when a loved one passes away, it is normal to be in a depressed state for a while. This is not seen as having major depressive disorder. If Rico has evidence that his wife is cheating on him, it is accepted as a normal trait to be suspicious. If you are in a job interview, you want to brag, you want to talk about your self-importance. This isn't abnormal and not narcissistic. Because the defining traits of personality disorders can also be seen as normal personality traits, mental health professionals should only apply a diagnosis of a personality disorder if the pattern of the behavior disrupts the functioning and cause significant personal distress to a person. This is still difficult to determine. In explaining personality disorders, traditional Freudian theory focused on unresolved audible conflicts and explaining normal and abnormal personality development. Freud believed that when a child resolves the Oedipus complex, they would obtain the moral principles held by their parents and form the superego. If something were to interfere with this process, it would prevent the child from forming moral standards, experiencing guilt and remorse, and possibly develop antisocial personal or antisocial behavior. More recent psychodynamic theorists have focused on the pre oedipal period, ages 18 months to three years, in explaining the development of such personality disorders as narcissistic and borderline personality. Hans Kohath described the idea of self-psychology, which emphasizes on processes and the development of a cohesive sense of self. His focus was the development of self-esteem, values, and a realistic sense of the self, as opposed to narcissistic personality. He labeled early childhood as having healthy narcissism, where they feel powerful enough as the world revolves around them. Parents who teach their children that anything is possible and cherish them builds their self-esteem while also disciplining their children properly as they grow and learn. A lack of parental empathy and support may cause the child to develop pathological narcissism. They fail to develop a sense of worth and self-esteem and often have damaged self-concepts while feeling they are incapable of being loved. They feel vulnerable and have difficulty or fail to achieve social and occupational goals. Otto Kornberg described borderline personality disorder developing due to failure in early childhood to develop a sense of constancy and unity in one's image of oneself and others. In Kornberg's view, when parents fail to meet all of their children's needs, they may associate images of a comforting, good mother with those of a withholding, bad mother. This may cause them later in life to have rapidly shifting attitude towards others, idolizing them one moment and rejecting them the next. Margaret Mahler explained borderline personality disorder resulting from separation from the mother figure in early childhood. She believed that in early childhood, children develop a symbiotic attachment to their mothers, meaning a state of oneness where the child's identity is deeply rooted in the mother's. However, over time, a child separates themselves from their mothers and develop their own identity. This can be a difficult process and the mother may disrupt this process if they refuse to let the child to develop their own sense of self or to push quickly towards independence. The tendencies of people with borderline personalities to react to others with ambivalence and to alternate between love and hate are suggestive there was difficulties in the separation process in childhood. Learning theorists view personality disorders in terms of maladaptive patterns of behavior rather than personality traits. Learning theorists seek to identify the early learning experiences and present reinforcers that may explain the development and maintenance of personality disorders. For example, children who are regularly discouraged from speaking their minds may develop dependent behavior patterns or excessive parental discipline may lead to obsessive compulsive behaviors. 
If Rico had a lack of reward or encouragement or even discouragement for exploratory behavior when he was a child, a learning theorist may believe that this may be the reason as to why Rico suffers from dependent personality disorder as an adult. Many theorists have argued that disturbed family relationships play roles in the development of many personality disorders. Antisocial personality disorder is connected with parental rejection or neglect and parental modeling of antisocial behavior. Children who are rejected or neglected by their parents may not develop attachment to others. Other family perspectives can include childhood physical or sexual abuse and parental overprotection and authoritarianism. According to the family perspective, the key factors in the development of antisocial personality are parental rejection, parental neglect, and failure of the parents to show love to the child. Research on biological perspectives have shown familial links and various personality disorders suggesting that genetic factors play a role. Some research evidence shows that people with antisocial personalities not only lack emotional responsiveness to physical threatening stimuli, but also have reduced levels of autonomic reactivity. People with antisocial personalities may also require higher levels of stimulation to maintain optimal levels of arousal. There is evidence that shows a genetic link between several of the personality disorders and thus personality traits may represent interaction of genetic factors and life experiences. Research shows that both genetic and environmental factors strongly influence the risk of a person developing an antisocial personality disorder. Other research shows that people with antisocial personalities have lower galvanic skin response levels when they were expecting painful stimuli than did normal controls. This shows there is a lack of anxiety in threatening situations. The craving for stimulation model shows that people with antisocial personality disorder need more stimulation than other people to maintain interest and function normally. Brain imaging links borderline personality and antisocial personality disorder to dysfunctions in parts of the brain involved in regulating emotions and impulsive behaviors. Most directly implicated are the prefrontal cortex and deeper brain structures and the limbic system. Social cultural theorists focus on adverse social conditions that may contribute to the development of personality disorders, especially antisocial personality. The effects of poverty and drug abuse can lead to family disorganization and disintegration, making it less likely that children will receive the nutrients and support to help them develop more socially adaptive behavior patterns. Antisocial personality disorder is reported most frequently among people from the lower socioeconomic classes. Maladjustments in school may lead to alienation and frustration in larger society. People with personality disorders believe others, not themselves, need to change. This is what makes it hard for people to realize they need to seek treatment. When they are unhappy or distressed, they do not see their own behavior as being the cause of their stress or unhappiness. This is the contributing factor as to why they may condemn others and believe they are the ones that need to change, not themselves. People with personality disorders do not seek help for their personality disorders on their own or argue with those that suggest they need help. When they finally get help, often they drop out of treatment or do not cooperate. Despite these occurrences, there is strong evidence that supports the effectiveness of psychotherapy for personality disorders. Psychodynamic approaches are often used to help those with personality disorders become aware of their self-defeating behaviors and learn more adaptive ways of relating to others. It helps them gain awareness of how their behaviors cause the problems and distress in the relationships they have or have lost. The therapy is very straightforward and confrontational that addresses the person's defenses. In cognitive behavioral therapy, it focuses on changing maladaptive behaviors and thought patterns rather than the personality structures. Techniques used include modeling and operant conditioning, 
mainly reinforcements. They are taught behaviors that are likely to be reinforced by others, and when they are reinforced, they are likely to repeat that behavior. Cognitive behavioral therapy has shown to be very effective in anxiety, so it is not surprising that it is also the case in cluster C disorders. The cognitive behavioral approach, which focuses on identifying and correcting distorted thinking, has been successful in treating borderline personality disorder, and when combined with mindfulness meditation, it shows more pronounced effect. When the cognitive behavioral approach is combined with mindfulness meditation, it is called dialectical behavioral therapy. When treating personality disorders with medication, they do not directly treat the personality disorder. They treat other symptoms of psychological disorders that may also accompany the personality disorder, such as depression and anxiety. Atypical antipsychotics may be beneficial in controlling aggressiveness and self-destructive behavior in those with borderline personality disorder. However, the effects are modest and the drugs carry serious potential side effects. Researchers suspect that the impulsive aggressive behaviors typical of some personality disorders may be related to deficiencies in serotonin as well. In addition to personality disorders, problems with impulsiveness as seen in borderline personality disorder are not limited to those with personality disorders. The DSM categorizes psychological disorders that are characterized by failure to control impulses, temptations, or drives that result in harm to oneself or others as an impulse control disorders. Impulse control disorders in the DSM-5 are grouped in a broader category of disruptive impulse control and conduct disorders. Other impulse control problems such as compulsive internet use are presently under consideration for inclusion in the diagnostic manual. Kleptomania is a type of impulse control disorder characterized by repeated acts of compulsive stealing. Stolen objects are typically of little value or use to the person. It is not typically motivated by anger or vengeance. People with kleptomania experience pleasurable excitement or gratification when they engage in compulsive stealing. Intermittent Explosive Disorder, or IED, is an impulse control disorder that includes impulsiveness and uncontrollable aggressiveness. They lash out at others with episodes of violent rage and loss of control, may destroy others' property. Before their episodes of rage and violent outbursts, they are in a state of tension and they have a sense of relief after their outbursts. They often try to justify their behavior, but they still feel remorse and regret because of their harm their behavior causes. Road incidents and road rage is common with IED. There are links to childhood trauma, violent behaviors, and the developments of IED. For instance, if Shelly just received a phone call letting her know she received a late charge for not paying her credit card on time, she throws her cell phone out the window and smashes the TV next to her. Friends say that Shelly does this often. Shelly most likely can be diagnosed as having intermittent explosive disorder. And lastly, pyromania, a disorder that is not well understood, characterized by impulsive, repeated acts of compulsive fire setting in response to irresistible urges. They, as well as all impulse control disorders, do not consider the consequences. It is seen that the most common motive is anger or revenge. They who have pyromania feel a sense of psychological relief when setting fires and may also feel a sense of empowerment. And this wraps up the lecture for Abnormal Psychology Chapter 13. Hope you enjoyed it. Learned something you didn't know. Did not fall victim to the Barnum Foyer effect. And I will see you in the next lecture. Ciao. They may become suspicious of family members. Other characteristics of someone with paranoid personality disorder are hypervigilant and improv. There have been what? Even as I write. Ugh.
not. This is not seen as having major depressive disorder. Seriously? Oh. <sighs>